It's 4 o'clock, so at that 4 p.m. here on September 15th, I call this hearing of the Adams, this uh, not hearing, but the meeting of the Adams Board of Health to order. Um, I do want to note, they have heard it is being recorded. Um, and due to the legislative act extending the pandemic waiver of being able to meet virtually. We are meeting uh, partly here and partly uh, online. Um, here in the room with me, our Vice Chair uh, Joyce Brewer, Member Peter Hoyt, myself, David Rhodes, Administrative Assistant uh, Michelle DeRose, and Code Enforcement Officer Mark Blaisdell. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, I don't want to miss public comment that I have here on the agenda. Uh, if anybody has anything to say other than the masking directive, uh, I'd like to hear that now. If someone has a brief. Uh, okay, hearing none, I close. Uh, you know, other than the masking, okay. Other than I have some, uh, some questions. Um, on um, what we do, what the Board of Health does in town uh, has, what other Board of Health I can do within the common. Uh, the state uh, Department of Health, they mandated that you notify first responders when they have the fire, ambulance, and the police. I've always, always wondered why you don't notify the community, because we're the ones that are going to be living in and around. And I'm guessing it's got something to do there are private there are privacy nice. issues. Maybe Nancy Slattery can answer well, that. Can. But the uh, that, that actually ended after the, that was the that was during the pandemic. Uh, we were allowed because only the board of health gets to know who is sick in town. But how do we protect ourselves? Like, I mean, in other words, you mentioned I think it was five people to five houses in one business. Um, so how, you know, we have to navigate around here. It's kind of like, I thought of the thing, I'm driving down the road and the bridge is out. Like the, the highway department doesn't put a sign up and I'm going 50 miles an hour at night and going off. Now with this pandemic and what's going on with it, how, how can I, because I'm an unvaccinated, I have my own reasons for that. Uh, how do I then avoid I mean, I've done pretty good so far, but. Uh, well, all, all I can say is that uh, uh, I, I, I agree with you. It's uh, difficult having, uh, knowing, not knowing when you're going to run, but people who have COVID uh, are actually obligated to stay in their house and isolate. And so you, you should not run into someone Unless that person is asymptomatic and doesn't know it yet. Well, what about business? Uh, but mm -hmm. if someone is is diagnosed as positive, they have to stay in their house for the for the isolation period. And if they've been exposed, they're supposed to stay in their house for the quarantine period. So, so basically, you just yeah, wear your mask. Keep your distance, wash your hands, hang out only with people you, you trust. And I know it's terrible. I mean, we, we're all living with it. That's... Okay, then I had another in the second paragraph of your uh, of your memo. No, no, that we're, we're 
holding out. And we obviously just it's not, it doesn't deal with this, it deals with the fire, the vaccinated and unvaccinated. Uh, I am I don't want to yes, uh, we I said that that. asking directive it as general for this order that we're going to discuss. Okay. Okay. So that thank you. Sorry, sorry for the confusion. Okay. So I do as we enter uh this uh uh old just what I call old business, new business to consider uh this directive regarding wearing masks, other face coverings, and related safety standards. Uh, we had also planned a COVID 19 update with our, uh, well, actually, with our uh, public health nurse, Nancy Slattery, who's up there on the screen, as well as Laura Kitros, who's our public health liaison at the Berkshire Regional Planning Commission. So I appreciate both of you coming. Thank you very much. Uh, I am going to pull up a very quick uh, PowerPoint with some data on it, which people were asking uh, data, data, data. Uh, after that, I'd like to hear from Laura and Nancy, and then maybe we can have a few comments. And I have received some comments uh, by email and phone. Beginning masking directive for today. I just wanted to start out with a um, a few articles that I pulled off the CDC website regarding masking. Uh, actually, it's, it's uh, sort of interesting. The first the first one there, the, the Chuk Chuk Tai, um, uh, actually analyzed masks and their effectiveness. And I was uh, so this K and 95 is supposed to be the top uh, protector, surgical masks. Uh, also, and the question is about cloth masks, very nice analysis, because uh, people would say, well, cloth masks are not as effective as like a KN95, but then the, it's interesting when you read further, it just depends on how tight they are around your cheek, around your nose and so forth. So there is, and, and a lot of this is on the CDC website. And so yes, when people say masks are ineffective, ineffective, they're they're as effective as one makes them. Uh, and then the second one there, practice of wearing surgical masks during uh, uh, so this was actually a letter, and the author actually wrote. Uh, a uh, an interesting uh, epidemiological study that was done in Taiwan versus Singapore. Taiwan uh, immediately uh, uh, slapped uh, masking and strict uh, measures on its population, and they ended up like a year later with 1.5 persons per 100,000 getting infected. Singapore delayed until the beginning of April. Uh, I forget when, I think we were the end of March. It was, it was uh, but anyhow, it, Singapore ended up with 20 infections per 100,000. Okay, so that's, that's uh, much, much more. So clearly the masking is strongly associated uh, and then finally, uh, there's this the third study I cite here, and I, I will put these slides online so uh, you can have the information. But the uh, uh, these investigators actually did a controlled study in Porto Alegre, uh, Brazil, a city of about 1.5 million, and they sort of ran through a control group and a uh, and a uh, study group and the study group basically they asked them all these questions about well how uh often you go outside when you go outside you socially distance when you're outside you wear a mask and 
So there was a whole scoring system. And it turned out that those individuals that uh, did socially distance or, or exposed themselves uh, less to uh, other people were a half to a third uh, less likely to develop COVID. And when, when they wore masks, that, that number of protection went up to 87%. So clearly distancing and, and masking uh, were shown to be effective in that case. Uh, show you a little bit of Berkshire County data. Uh, so this, this comes from the Public Health Institute of Western Massachusetts. They put up a dashboard uh, weekly. Uh, unfortunately, it comes up on Thursday, so this is almost a week old. But I wanted to point out uh, the current cases here, Berkshire County 393 in this two week period, and that's up from 380. Uh, this is the ending, this is ending uh, uh, current two week period on uh, August 22nd through September 4. And then the prior two week period was uh, 380. Um, we, and during that period, we also had three deaths, uh, bringing us up to 306 as of this. Uh, uh, so yesterday there were two more deaths. And so we're up to 309. Uh, I just read in Washington Post today that uh, nationwide, uh, one in four, one in 500 people in the U.S. have died of COVID. In Berkshire County, is one in 400. So it's a little bit worse than the national average when, when we're done here. So, uh, and then this is just a, a, a trend from July 2020. Through September 4th, uh, you see the jagged lines. Uh, these are the towns starting with uh, uh, Pittsfield at the top. Sorry, it's, it's small writing, but you, you can appreciate uh, the surges uh, through this past year. Uh, and I blew up uh, Adams there on the right, and you can see, you know, we, we are ending up here September 4th with this sharp increase again. Uh, and these these next three slides come from uh, Dr. Dan Doyle, who's been uh, consulting with us on uh, uh, COVID-related issues with the uh, with the county. Uh, and I just wanted to point out, I mean, it's a very busy slide here. Uh, this is mid-July, uh, one confirmed patient uh, in in uh, in the hospital. 490 in acute care. That's the cumulative 490 acute care. We come one month later, three confirmed patients, and we're now at the 510. So we've added 20 more in acute care in that month. And we, uh, so uh, 30 more, 30 more as of September 10th. And we've got 10 confirmed patients, and no here that uh, uh, three of them are now uh, ventilated, or at least were ventilated at the time. So fairly sick. Uh, so numbers going up. Uh, Adam's data, thanks to uh, Nancy Slattery from Maven. Uh, in July, there were 16 cases in August 71. And uh, through September 12th, there were 17 more cases. I think I've made the point uh, last week that 71 is about two and a half people per day, 17, one and a half people per day. Is that <laughs> where you want to draw the line about it's okay? Uh, and of course, this is also germane uh, cases by age cohort of those 88. Uh, August, September of those 88, almost a quarter of them uh, uh, were under 12. These are the unvaccinated people. And then, of course, we have the 12 to 20, 20 to 30 cohort of uh, making the bulk and in general for unvaccinated people. And then we uh, over 40, again, 30, about a third of the cases. Um, 
this is just mostly from the Eagle, uh, looking at uh, the Eagle checkup, uh, this is, uh, two week totals, again, uh, August going from 6, 14 to 31, September 4th, 46. And I just looked on the mass uh, dashboard today, 14, so that 17 looks like it's two, two more, four more cases or two more per day uh, since September 12. Uh, and I, I just want to end here. We are, because we are asking people to ask and, and to have the uh, businesses uh, and event planners uh, enforce this, I call, it, I call it a directive. I'm going to make a comment about that shortly. Uh, examples of signs. Uh, for these, and we, we will put a series of these up on the website that will be acceptable. Uh, businesses, uh, event planners can choose. Uh, this is actually kind of uh, a fold wearing a mask, the governor's mask wear. Uh, and this is one of my favorites, I think, uh, Stop COVID-19, it just has a list of everything. So it's just basically just an alert and what we need. Uh, and then this is one, uh, this one from Pennsylvania. Um, true, my mask protects you, your mask protects me. And so uh, it's basically a handshake here. Of we, we're, we're, we're helping each other. Uh, so they thank you here. And uh, Nancy, did you have anything you might want to add to? Uh, no, Dave, you did a really good job. But the, the one thing in that last little poster that you um, presented with all the instructions, the very last one that yeah. said um, um, the whole series of little issues, uh, um, um, reminders, and the, the bottom, the, the top one would be get vaccinated. Yes. <laughs> top, if not vaccinated, get vaccinated. Yes. yes. Thank you. Um, so... Uh, and Laura, did you, did, did the two of you want to make any kind of update here uh, for us or, uh, as we move on to, or should I open the floor to some questions, comments? Uh, I, I will start with uh, this word directive. And I know if we banged it around with the town officials a bit, uh, and I think in my cover letter, I made it fairly clear that this is not a mandate. Um, and for those who say, you know, there are penalties, there are not penalties. Um, the order will end with saying we are not uh, creating penalties at this point. We're relying on the honor system and on everyone's community spirit to mask up, to get those numbers back down again. Um, so it is not a mandate to call it a directive, basically to uh, uh, say how urgent we feel the issue is. So it is, it is our uh, total hope that we will indeed, uh, you know, just by, everyone sort of going back to the social distancing and masking and, and that we will be able to stop or at least slow the spread so this coronavirus can uh, uh, can leave the town. David, could I throw one more thing out too, please? Yes. Um, the other concern that I have is, as, as you notice, the increase in the children. Um, because the kids are all back in school, especially the elementary kids that are unvaccinated and cannot get vaccinated at this point, I really think that the um, with the numbers of 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 um, COVID in Adams, I think it's wise to to at least do the go back to the social distancing and go to the mask if people are not going to get fully vaccinated. Because the kids are the ones that are that we're seeing the numbers rise in. Last month we had no children. Um, positive with COVID. 
this month we have um what i say 19? 19 that's yeah. a lot and those are the little kids those aren't the middle school's not too bad high school's not too bad because those guys are getting vaccinated it's the babies that we want to protect and those are the ones that are getting sick right now that i'm seeing and those are the ones that i'm worried about so that's why i feel at this point right now if the majority of people that I'm calling in Adams are not getting vaccinated and about half of the people that I speak to are not vaccinated. That's what we need to do just to keep our kids okay and healthy in school. If we want to keep them in school and we want our economy to turn around, that's, that's just. I would, I, yeah, I have to, because you, you did mention earlier in a, that, that there is household spread. And so uh, so once someone in the house gets sick, it's fairly easy for household members to get sick, whether or not they're vaccinated. So That's true. We are getting we are getting um, the kids in school though because they're all getting together and they're um, they're they're together and they're under the six feet limit. Um, we are getting cases in the schools, and yes, the households the households are. Um, the entire household is getting ill, but it's as a rule because there's one person in the household who is unvaccinated that's bringing it into the household. That's what I'm. That's what I'm seeing. One person is not vaccinated. Two, three, four other people are vaccinated, but the ones that are vaccinated are getting mild cases. The little kids are out of school. That's that's what I'm seeing. And thank you. And the second question I had is the the Polish picnic was last. Sunday, um, that's a little bit soon for a spreader, but I was wondering about uh, Susan B. Anthony, where I met you, that was August 21. Have you, do you have any sense whether there was any spread as a result of our Susan B. Anthony festival? No, I didn't not the contacts that I talked to David didn't say that they attended anything. They didn't attend a Susan B. Anthony. So um, they had a, an, uh, an ill mother in law or or somebody got it at work. Um, Susan B. Anthony didn't come up. So that's important because we have some pretty nice <laughs> events coming up in town. Right. And, uh, and it, it what it says to me is that you know, people were behaving themselves, if I could say it that way, mm -hmm. at, at the festival, mm -hmm. and, and it worked. Uh, I, yeah. I hope I'm not just being overly optimistic, but that was my take. Um, and the 21st, I mean, cases were going up and down. Um, so, okay. Uh, uh, John, you have, yes. I guess I had two questions on one. And these numbers that you're giving us, the 16, the 71, the 17, and the 21, uh, are those just town of Adams? Yeah. Okay. All right. And then uh, they are going down. Well, if you if you spread it over time, it started out at 16, yeah, 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 70, yeah. Up, down to 17, and then uh, down as much 21. So it may jump up one or two. But that's those are the numbers are that's what they are. Yes, yes. Now, you had mentioned a study, and I don't remember which one it was, um, but I think all three of them, none of those were really a clinical study, right? They were anecdotal. Because I don't know if any study, because they don't, there's no way you can do it. Closest thing that I know of was a clinical study was done by the United States Marines. They took, I think it was a whole company, they quarantined them for two weeks, but what they didn't do was unquarantine, you know, let them get another group on the same base. So they didn't really run it properly, I'll say. That's the murkiness of epidemiolo epidemiological studies, right. is because the last thing you want to do is to take two groups of people and say, oh, I'm going to throw you in here with all these COVID positives right. and, and, and you know, with we the masks, and it's like, no, no. We, we, do, we can only, we can only design as robust as studies, uh, perspective uh, like the like the Porto Allegro uh, study um, and and some of them are retrospective basically the analysis between Singapore and Taiwan is that yes is, is it possible 
that some other reason, so I was saying before you go up so high. Uh, yes, it is, but one looks, continues to look at the, uh, uh, we're not getting bombed, are we? <laughs> Oh, God. Stop sharing. I am not your viewing. Can we uh, get this monkey off somehow? It's an ape with a monkey in some instances. <laughs> That's the trick. No, we don't know. It's not the apes. <laughs> Whoever's the owner of the Zoom can probably make the person stop sharing. Whoever's the host. Michelle here. First name was Mitch. Mitch is an on. No, it was it was Jack somebody. Jack one? Yeah. Jack Munn here. He's online. Okay, it's on. It's on. <laughs> Maybe he turned off. Oh, thank you. Does um, that? I, I guess it does, uh, Dr. Rose, but I guess I would only refer back to what uh, Dr. Fauci and who had stated earlier about this. Right. It was really about helping people that have less fear. And, and, I do. and they really don't. They don't work, but that's okay. I made my statements. Yeah, they do. You know, they the early, you know, I did mention about the U.S. delay. You know, Fauci would say there'd be a flip flopper. First, he said that's not necessary, and then he did, and they were. Uh, but in the beginning, there was this uh, lack of clarity about whether the virus was passed via contact or via aerosol, right. and so that really explains part of why. The mask, mask, masking directive came uh, a bit later, and unfortunately, it would have helped had it come a bit earlier. But mm -hmm. uh, so, anyhow, uh, do we, uh, lady? Yes. Hi, Tracy Dale. First, I'm not sure if the uh, health personnel are still online. Yeah. I have a question in particular. I have something else I'd like to say. But I had a question in particular regarding the current cases and of the numbers, how many people are seriously ill? How many are asymptomatic? And how many are ill at the level of perhaps having a cold or something just slightly more than a cold? So your vaccinated people are, what I'm seeing are cold symptoms. And fortunately for them, that's good. Um, and your unvaccinated are pretty sick. They're, they're, they're down and out. They're in, the, they're in with the flu, upset stomach, diarrhea, sore throats, sore ears, um, hospitalizations for short of breath, shortness of breaths. Um, same thing that we saw with the, co the, uh, the first round last year. Um, but your vaccinated people are doing much better with this. And honestly, if everybody was vaccinated, we'd be all walking around thinking we had head colds and we'd be okay um, because everybody's vaccinated. But the fact that some people are not vaccinated makes it so that they get very sick. And those are the ones that we're worried about. And are, does that include the children? That's absolutely uh, includes the children. Those children that can't be vaccinated, those, that's why I'm on here today. Okay. And you mentioned people being put in the hospital. I see there's only 10 currently in all of Berkshire County. Is that correct? Or there's se no, there's 70 that's, people. That's from last week. So that's from last week. I'm not sure what this week's numbers are, but they may be different. Okay, but that's all Berkshire County. Right. Yeah. That's at Berkshire Medical Center. Okay, and how many of those patients that are in the hospital? How many of them are elderly or they have other serious health issues that may have put them into this situation? Well, you know, I don't really want to get into the politics of that. Um, honestly, if you're in the hospital with COVID, if you have a pre-existing lung disease, I, you know, I wouldn't want to die of COVID with a pre-existing lung disease. Um, 
because I have a pre-existing lung disease. Um, I would rather get the vaccination and not end up in a hospital at all, which is, is, is pretty much the point. Everybody has comorbidities, unless you're a young, healthy, strapping athlete. So, um, and, but the COVID puts your comorbidities over the top and you can end up dying. That's the issue with COVID. And, and Nancy, if I could just add to that, our older population is pretty well vaccinated in the Berkshires. So, um, and again, I don't work for the hospital, so I can't say what the current numbers are of people or their ages, but we're definitely seeing a younger age cohort being hospitalized in the last couple months than we saw, say, a year ago. You know, there's exceptions like when you have the North Adams Commons outbreak or something like that, you know, we see a lot of elderly people ending up in the hospital, but we're seeing a lot of middle-aged people um, and some even younger than that um, that are ending up in the hospital now. Um, because they're unvaccinated, usually because they're unvaccinated. Right. In the 20 to 30 to 40 age group are the ones that form the highest percentage of cases, and they're also the, actually at this point the highest percentage of hospitalization. Right. If I'm not mistaken. And right. So yeah, I don't know that. I mean, I, I just look at the at the yellow at the end of Dan's green bars, and the, the 20 to 29 is the longest one, and it's got the most yellow at the end. And so, I mean, it's you're not talking too many people, but it's it is the biggest bar with the most yellow. So, uh, young and strong is not necessarily a protection. Right. When it comes to the households. Do you find that this is any more prevalent than what you typically see, especially when the children first go back to school? Colds, stomach flus, those type of things, uh, even the regular flu. In my past knowledge, it, when it hits a household, pretty much it goes through the household. Is COVID some kind of rabid animal that goes through households faster and harder? It does, honestly. Um, it, it's, it's like once it gets into the air. See, a year ago when we were dealing with the alpha, you could you could isolate people and put them up in the up in the bedroom, and you can still do that if you're really serious about isolating. And I mean isolate. Um, wear a mask when you come downstairs to go to the bathroom. Clean that bathroom out if you're sharing that bathroom. I mean, being scrupulous. A year ago, you could get away with isolating your teenage kid up in a bedroom and nobody else in the house came down with it. They were able to come off their isolation on day seven or day eight and go back to work. I'm not seeing that now. I'm seeing one person get sick and within days, everybody else starts getting sniffly. Um, even if that kid's a teenager and they hibernate up in their room, it's in the household and people have it. It's it's not like chicken pox. It's not as transmissible as chicken pox, but it's pretty close. The Delta is nasty. And, and there are several days before symptoms arise when you're still infectious. So that's that's. Uh, what makes it so insidious is that you don't know you're infected, but you're passing it on. Right. My comments are not directed at the health people. Should I speak now or should I wait? Uh, I, yeah, that's, I don't want to take too, too much time here because I want to get into the guts of the directive. I, I, I think that I, I do, I do want to hear. Yes. Okay. What is concerning to not only me, but many others in the town was how this unfolded with little to no notice last week as an urgent matter without being able to give the metrics to determine the urgency. It's equally concerning that there is a strong push by the chairman of the Board of Health that they would push to institute fines and penalties on business owners for non-compliance. If surrounding communities do not have the same order slash mandate slash advisory slash directive, it sets a bad tone for Adams businesses that are already struggling. The restaurants are all on a level playing field from community to community, but this would not be the same for other businesses than Adams. Many businesses would be competing with other like-kind businesses 
in neighboring communities such as North Adams, Williamstown, and Pittsfield for not only retail business with these restrictions, but also the private employers, as well as retailers for employees to hire and to keep. If a business chooses to follow the order advisory directive, that is up to them to make the decision without fear of retribution of fines and license or permit revocation. That's what we say, that's what we say here. Oh, I'll, I'll speak of this again. Did you, did you read, did you read? Oh, I it? did, I did thoroughly. Read. Did it, and did it say? Uh, I get to that at the bottom. Yeah. Uh, there is no denying that the issue of mandating masks is a very controversial and adversarial one. With less than 1% of the population and households being determined to have tested positive in our town in August, with no additional information as to the severity of illness, it appears to have been an overreaction at this time. The option of any individual or business remains to wear a mask if they deem it necessary for them as individuals or businesses. No one would ever take that right away from them. I also agree with Mr. Cowley's argument that if the town of Adams could not pay for a school nurse at St. Stanislaus School, as it was not constitutional, it would seem to follow logic that the town of Adams cannot impose directives at St. Stanislaus School under the Constitution. Separation of church and state should be applied the same across these issues, especially since in both instances, they do apply to the health of the children, per Chairman Rhodes' definition regarding mass. St. Stan School did a far superior job of educating their students and in person through all of last year and does not warrant additional oversight. My biggest concern of all is that there was this urgent call for action. It was based on figures which when ultimately prepared for the town as a whole reflected less than 1% of the town's population and household numbers. It does not seem prudent to issue such a response. It only causes panic and fear where there is no basis, basis to support it with over 99% not failing in health due to COVID. All sides of the public health of our townspeople needs to be considered. It's well known that there has been a real escalation in the deterioration of mental health of many citizens. Excuse me, I, I, please. I, 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 I'm almost done. I, 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 you don't want to hear? You don't want to hear? I, all sides of the public health of our common town folk need to be considered. It's well known that there has been a real escalation in the deterioration of mental health of many citizens, fueled by the pandemic, by isolation, but also the reactions and confusing information that is being disseminated by various governmental bodies. It would be helpful to all people if time and careful consideration is undertaken before calling in a call of urgency and alarm over such a small proportion of the population of our town. Lastly, as to the language of the proposed directive, I would like to hear from town council on the legality of section five enforcement as written. In particular, the third paragraph, which states that if the Board of Health finds it necessary to compel public compliance the Adams Board of Health, under its authority, may implement regulations to enforce this directive. Penalties could include daily fines, suspensions, and revocation of Board of Health permit, permits. I would like to hear if that is legal. Thank you. Well said. So I, I will not make any further comment here, but I will uh, add Attorney St. John that uh, and I will make it was a question about the first, the last whereas here uh, that the Board of Health is is authorized to in the in the uh, uh, protection of public health to pass regulations and rules. Uh, I will say that a regulation has the force of law and can entail penalties. It also requires us to have a public hearing published ahead of time and so on. And this is not a regulation on, I don't know what the rule is, maybe Attorney St. John, I think they would have, I'm thinking of this more as a rule, uh, uh, like a golden rule. Uh, All right, well, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So what you have in front of you is something that is not a regulation, 
you do use the language of chapter 111, section 31, which should be stricken from this because you didn't comply with that statute. And it confuses, it confused me, and I told you that by way of email, uh, because it gives the impression that this is a Board of Health uh, regulation. And it, it, it is to me nothing more than an advisory uh, at this point. It's not enforceable by any court action. The code enforcement officer can't go into a business and issue fines because the business is allegedly not cooperative. All this is is an advisory. So in answer to that question about section five, yes, the Board of Health can take further action, meaning come back again, post the proposed regulation as it's supposed to be posed, uh, proposed and published um, under section 31, have a public hearing, as you mentioned, and hear debate and make a determination whether they uh, will pass that or not, because it is, as you said, it's within your powers to protect the public health and safety to enact such a regulation. It doesn't mean it won't be subject to a court challenge by somebody, uh, but at least you're following the process by following Section 31. You haven't done it in this situation. That's why I'm telling you this is nothing more than an advice. So I, I will, when we get to that, and instead of spreading it, I will, I will say, whereas, well, if I have agreement, this Board of Health feels it is necessary to ask that the community take measures, take standard measures to stop the spread of COVID, some, something like that. So it would just be basically we as health experts uh, take this stand. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense to me, but I, I, I want them to know, and I want the public to know, and I want the people in this audience to know that this is not a regulation which is going to be somehow enforced against people at this stage. This is not something that anybody is going to penalize or fine anybody for because there are no provisions in this, nor was it enacted in such a way as to put those provisions in. Uh, it's simply, as you're saying, it's basically, to me, it's a, it's a cry for help or it's an advisory and nothing more than that. Thank you. That's exactly. Uh, exactly, exactly. Uh, were, there any, were there any other, uh, Chairman Duvall? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm John Duvall. I'm chair of the Adams Board of Selectmen, and I agree with uh, Attorney St. John that when I went through this document, I was very confused. Um, the word directive can mean a couple of things. A directive can be uh, an order that's binding, or it, it's a, it may not be binding. So how do you define directive? You've directed several times in this uh, document. An order mandate is, I know what an advisor is, but what, how do you define a director? So what, what, uh, what phrase or word? Well, the well, word director, it's uh, throughout this document. So what, so according to the Department of Public Safety, if you know, what is, how is directed defined in regards to uh, uh, providing these uh, mandates or? Um, Not a mandate. Right, but in for anything that any advisory or mandate that comes out of the Department of Public Health, what does what is uh, directed? How is it referred to? Is it is it mandatory? Is it because because I'm concerned if you go if you can if this before any stuff they this document required to you post it, and I don't think you can even post it uh, at this point. According to one Mr. Saint John, Attorney Saint John has said, but. Um, the word directed to me, if I was, if we posted this, you know, as a citizen, it directed to me means it's, it's an order. That's what we need to do. So I'm asking. I'm you, asking you the experts, I'm asking the experts what the <laughs> word directed me. So, I'm just as, as a citizen and as a board of selectmen representing myself, it's just the word directed to me just throws me off as a citizen and as, as a member of the, how that is, government. Um, so I don't want to spend too much time on this. 
I'll, I'll move on if that's okay. And also, you have the word um, shall. That, yeah, I, I know. That that. Also, let me let me interrupt you. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna okay. purge. Yeah, I, I I think that's uh okay. Yeah, that, that that's a bad word here. So that the shalls will. All the shells have to be removed, and I just again yeah, shells will become shoulds. <laughs> uh, that's good. Yeah. So I I think the as I mentioned it directly. Uh, so, but I would uh, uh, like something stronger than advisory. <laughs> okay. Do we have a word stronger than advisory? Well, it's why the directive is fine, but again, just what is that uh, definition for the public? So the everybody's on the same page. Um, and, and I and just the last thing, not to carry this on, but I would hope. And Attorney St. John has indicated that this would not be uh, approved this evening. Approved this evening. That would be whichever way you go, it's your authority. Uh, whichever way you go, that uh, that's rewritten so it's clear for the community and the business uh, uh, sector that we we're all understand what needs to be done. Uh, reading this, you know, we 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 talked about a few items. Uh, that um, it, it would cause uh, confusion among the citizens of the town. So I would, I would request that the board um, not uh, not approve this today and bring it back and, and follow uh, to say if you go that route, um, uh, if you go with the directive and the um, and requirements that it be uh, reviewed by Attorney St. John and. Uh, and brought back for future meeting, or would become an advisory, and uh, make it, it's meant to make it stronger than the state's advisory. The state has an advisory we're following. Uh, if that's where the board goes, again, it's your prerogative where you go with this. But uh, just the way it's written, it's very confusing. And I think if you post it, even removing the, the shells and, uh, and and what Attorney St. John said, it's just it's just too confusing uh, for the community. Right? So you're confused. Yeah. So to say the least. Um, so my sentence in the cover letter, I intentionally chose the word directive, which falls short, I say just short, short of a mandate to convey my alarm about our present crisis. And so if I uh, define directive in the, in the whereas is, as not a mandate, but a, a strong advisory that would that satisfy you? And then we can continue. So it's already defined up front that this is, that we use the word directive because it's the strongest one we could find. Uh, but, it, and, but then we, we do say, or at least when I rewrote this, uh, uh, If the enforcement is, uh, we, we respectfully request that the persons or entity in control uh, will assume the obligation. So it's basically trying to encourage businesses, post the signs, and I don't want them kicking people out because they're coming in on that, but, but that, but that it, we, we, we have a culture of Masking and distancing until our numbers go down. Is that yeah, right? That's that's fine. And what you mentioned encouraging that so the, the businesses do not have to post this up. Right, right. Right, but that's you would the board would encourage them to do so. And to their their patrons, it's up to them. Um, so you encourage them to um, speak to their patrons if they so feel you know, to choose to do that. That uh, they indicate that we wear a mask. That's not that totally up to the business themselves. So, right, um, right. so again, I just um, reading through your letter, and even the name of the uh, file is masked by order. But uh, I just, the uh, name as, of the as written, I just don't think it's, uh, I think it should be reread, reviewed by Tony St. John, and then brought back so it's very clear, everyone can understand. And, and again, I speak to myself, but it's just, it's a good. I just feel that the other community, this would be a confusing one. Or not order, sorry, correct. <laughs> Any other comments? Yes. I said the same thing last week. Nobody's against the board 
I was watching out for ourselves. You, I told you last week, you brought this material, but I'm wondering, you said it was for August. The paperwork you gave us last week was for August. Okay. Right. What about August of last year? What about the year before? And every, for the past 10 years, every year in the past 10 years, <clears throat> what are the, what are the, uh, the numbers for the people who have died of, of pneumonia, the flu, the common cold? They do die from it. Are they different than these numbers? That's all we're asking. Because if we knew those numbers, you know, if you want the, the community to get behind you, you don't need to be militant about it. You need to show us the numbers so we can say, oh, it is worth it. Because I don't see it. Well, I don't know. And, you're, and you're, right now, you have no answer for that. So it leads me down the road to believe that there are, there, there, the numbers are not worse. <laughs> They're saying. I'm having a hard time understanding the question. The numbers as far as what? COVID? Last year we were in a mess too. No, I last know. year we were all masking too. Nancy, I think he's asking how many people were in ICU and hospitalized due to other illnesses than COVID. Last year? In the last 10 years. No, no, in the last 10 years. I'm, I'm gonna, excuse me. We have the last lots 10 years, of before COVID, before COVID came, we had sick people in the hospital all the time. Right, we, people, we had flu. In this period here, how many people died of the flu, pneumonia, and the common cold? And is it bigger than this number in the past two years is what I'm asking, and nobody yes. seems to talk about it. Yes. Two years, ago, two, two, year, two years ago, two years ago, two years ago, before this whole mess started, I was doing flu clinics, and two, sure. two, two and a half years ago, say, um, the total number of deaths due to flu in 2000 and say it was 18, say it was 2018, was 88,000 people. What are we looking at for COVID deaths so far just this year alone? Well, you just said flu. You didn't consider pneumonia also. You have to add those numbers to the 88,000. And that's what nobody's doing. And that's what a lot of people are concerned about. Well, then those numbers would be hard, larger then. The numbers would then be increased. They'd be even more. So that's that's the concern of a lot of people. And again, we're not arguing against what you're saying. We're just trying to get a good number so we understand completely that we're in more danger now than we were 10 years ago. So so if I may, if I may, if I may, there's very good data out there for, on a national level. I don't know that we've tried to do it on a Berkshire County level. It wouldn't be impossible to do on the number of excess deaths that we've seen over the last 18 months. Um, and it's something that they've looked at um, to make sure that we're not, I think your concern is that people that would have died of pneumonia three years ago are now dying of COVID and we're kind of double counting them. Um, and I, I think that enough research has been done to show that there's been an extraordinary number of um, excess deaths, excess, you know, meaning deaths over what we would have expected right. in the, since March of 2020. Right. Um, and that, you know, sure, is there an occasional person who would have ended up in the hospital with pneumonia who ended up in COVID or who died of a heart attack because they had COVID and died a couple of weeks earlier? That's certainly possible. Um, but we have many, many more people who would not have died if they had not caught COVID. Um, and absolutely, we saw fewer flu deaths this year because people were isolating at home, people were wearing a mask, people were, um, so that when you look at excess deaths, that's accounted for is that we saw, I'm, I'm making this up, but we saw 40,000 fewer deaths from flu, let's say in the United States this year, but we still saw five or 600,000 deaths over what, based on the last 10 years, what we would have expected to see over the last um, 18 months. Um, so and like I said, is, oh, sorry. no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of wrapping up saying that, you know, so, um, you know, I think it's a good question. And I think that, you know, what you're asking is really important. We want to make sure we're not just counting deaths that we would have normally seen and calling them COVID deaths now. Um, but I think the, the research has been done again on a, on a county, on a country level. Um, that shows that is not the case. Well, moving forward, as far as Adams is concerned, as far as the county's concerned, those numbers need to be pr produced so we can see them 
physically see them in a newspaper, some kind of publishing so the, so the communities can get behind you and not, not be confrontational like it was last week. Last week was ridiculous. Today's is better, but we don't have the information to, in the past, we're all over 40, this is what I said last week, we're all over 40, our whole lives were geared towards statistics and facts. Very lacking in the past year and a half, two years. Very lacking. All we're saying is meet us halfway and come up and, and have honest numbers. Show us where people are sicker now than they were before. I believe you, but until I see it, paperwork on it. Can we wrap this up? Because, yes, uh, none of us are going to come out with numbers off the top of our head. Now, I never asked you to come off the top of your head. head. I, I would you. just, at this point, uh, rely on uh, what we hear from as to Department of Public Health, what we hear from CDC, uh, advisories coming out. And I do appreciate that one, one of the other constituents said, I mean, you're, you're sort of saying, why are we just slapping this on without thinking? And it's, it, it isn't without thinking. It is, we really want to pin uh, cases are at this level, let's do this. If cases go down, let's relax. If cases go up, Let's get more strict and again, trying not to uh, have to issue a mandate. I think that's the last thing any of us would, would want to do. Uh, David, can you make a comment on, on this question? So yeah. I, I think it was a good question. I think the numbers you're looking for, I think part of the problem is the people that have those numbers are too busy dealing with uh, with the pandemic stuff and the healthcare stuff to compile that uh, for you. So I think that that's part of the issue. And I, and I hope that at some time in the future, they'll have the time to put those numbers out. I, I think that's the reason why. So there's, I don't think, I think the numbers are there. Nobody's put it together to present to anybody that nationwide, countywide, townwide. And that's fine, but does that need to be communicated? I, I, somebody I, 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 I think that that's an excellent point you're making, Thank that, you. um, that people need to see those numbers. And, you know, here we are just saying, wear a mask, get vaccinated, but show me show me some facts here, show me some data to back that up. I, I agree with you. I appreciate that. And I miss you not being here last week because I'm I sorry for saying that your credibility went down last right, week right. because it, it, it was so horrible, and it looked like you're trying to ram something down. So I'm not going to talk anymore. I have I have 40 people I have to go cook cook for right now. So thank you for your time, and you got all the nice ones. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Uh, you know, I'm sure you just want to make three quick little comments. Please, you just stop for a minute and listen. No. Okay. Well, I'll tell you. Just just really on uh, public radio just the other day, Denmark. Is taking all restrictions off and they're in their country. You probably got restrictions on people coming into the country. Why? 77% of their population is fully vaccinated. That's just the first shot, fully vaccinated. If they can do it, why can't we do it? And has anyone in their lifetime ever heard of a hospital in this country or a statewide medical system in a state in this country telling the hospitals they can restrict? admissions to their critical care beds because they're being overloaded. Well, that's the state of Idaho right now in this country. You know, it's, I forget my third point. But... Here, okay. here. <laughs> Have you ever heard that happen in this country in your lifetime? I know. Uh, that's what you call a death scam. They're determining who can be admitted to hospitals now in the state of Idaho. That's, and then, oh yeah, the third comment was, you ever heard in your lifetime about the great rate of burnout amongst medical people leaving the, their careers and deciding to go to another career because of burnout in this last two years. Never heard of that mentioned in my lifetime. I'm 77 years old. Oh, thank mm -hmm. you. Um, I think it's probably time for us to hash the directive slash strong advisory um, and I think first off, 
whether you feel we should take comments into effect, pick out another proposal, meet sooner rather than later, or I, I guess I have um, concerns with um, the, the process of this uh, based off of um, what Chairman Wall had said in, in um, Terry St. John. So I want to make sure we're following the process correctly. And I want to make sure that the language in here is approved by Attorney St. John before we forward, I guess. I'm fine with talking through this and, and cleaning some of this up. Um, and then us taking that, or you taking that draft to, and meet with Attorney St. John and make sure he approves it before we move forward. That's that's where I stand right now. I don't want to... I was actually going to ask for a volunteer to do the next iteration because I put, I put a lot of effort in this. And that uh, I, I feel that I am possibly stuck in my own words. And I would greatly appreciate if someone else were to uh, undertake to uh, uh, rewrite it in a way that makes uh, that you feel answers. Uh, well, can I ask? And Attorney St. John, have we followed the process correctly? I guess if we if we went and voted on something tonight. Well, you know, I the, the, there's really no process that's being followed here, except that you posted a meeting and you're going to discuss this. Uh, this is not a regulation. It hasn't been posted properly under Chapter 111, Section 31. Uh, uh, frankly, what John Duval mentioned, what you're talking about, is going back to the table you know, rewriting this in a way that, you know, meets whatever the intention is with respect to this. If it's going to be a regulation, fine, then draft it up as a regulation, follow 111.31, and we'll deal with it that way. If it's going to be something other than that, which I've called an advisory, uh, Dr. Rhodes calls a directive, or whatever the species is called, you know, let's get together on it and figure that out so that it's clear, because your job also not only is to express your intent, but your intent has to be manifested in a clear, unambiguous way. And you can tell from all the comments here, this is anything but unambiguous, okay? Thank you. So I, I guess my other comment would be, if this is just an advisory to the public, you know, why not just keep the cover letter and ditch everything else? I'm just, just, I guess all we're reiterating is just what we've been saying for the last 18 months is wear a mask, wash your hands, and social distance. And hey, by the way, there's a vaccine out there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> really? Hmm. I, I don't understand why. If it's just an advisory, why are we going through all this, getting everybody all worked up? Let's just, Publish our that stuff in the newspaper with everybody already knows and, and leave it at that. No reason for the director. I, I, I guess maybe I'm confused. I, I don't know. Well, and so basically, uh, you were saying that the items here could be included in the cover letter. And basically, this is a letter to the townspeople of Adams expressing our extreme urgency at the current situation. Yeah, I, and I don't know if I'm, you know, I don't know if I'm completely sold that it needs to be that urgent, but, you know, I, I think that's all we're trying to do is just reiterate that, you know, there's potential here for things to spiral out of control again, like it did last year. Just, you know, like you said, stop the spread. Just be courteous and wear a mask and wash your hands and social distance. I don't, I don't know. 
you know, and post it on our website and, you know, put it on wherever, but I don't know if we need to. Would you be willing to take the next step? To write it? Yeah. Sure. Okay. That's all I need. That's... Because I have a few other things I need to do this week, and I got a ton of stuff too. No, 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 no. I mean, the board of health stuff. We don't get to. So, uh, if I could say one thing, I think that we're just asking the residents of Adams in a call to action, and just as a reminder to the call for action that we're all part of the community, and anything that you can do to prevent this issue from getting worse is all we're asking. I mean, that's how I see it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, that I mean I can't argue with that. So, but uh, uh, so yeah, that and then I guess the only question is uh, when to meet next, uh, depending on how urgent we feel about it. Uh, We'll get an update from DMC next Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah, we'll get the numbers Tuesday and then you the call on Wednesday. You'd be willing to meet in two weeks. Yeah, I'm pretty. So, like, uh, September 29th. Mr. Cowley? If I ask, since Desi is going to um, revisit their mask mandate on October 1st, um, I guess you can go ahead and see what you're going to do, but <laughs> maybe whatever they do, we solve them problem. Right. No, I, I know it's going two days ahead of Desi, but uh, I, I think when we come two weeks down the road, we'll see whether numbers, if numbers are going down, we sort of anticipate Desi will stay the same or relax. And if not, uh, so I, I'm not that worried. I think I'd much more rather just get our strong word out as soon as possible. And then we have our two days. Yeah. So we we'll, we may have um location ahead of right. Um, <laughs> and I believe when Desi if Desi does change, um I uh we can issue or put their information on the website promoted in a way because it is it's public health information. So we don't we don't have to uh, run that through a meeting a public meeting. I think it, because it's public health information, we can uh, put it out. Uh, I, I can put it out uh, without without consulting. So okay, so let's make that plan. Uh, two weeks. Continue. Um, Four p.m. 4 p.m. Yep. Yeah. Uh, okay. All the end of this agenda item. Uh, I see uh, John and Gracie still there. Good. Uh, so at this point, uh, we will entertain a public hearing uh, regarding original seed and um, and lounge requesting a booth at the uh, Ramble Fest. Uh, I need, I make a motion to open this uh, public hearing on the issue raised by original seed and lounge. Second. Yeah, second. Any discussion? Hearing none, uh, Joyce. Am I okay to vote on this since it's tobacco related? Uh, we're opening the hearing, so. So I can. 
Yeah, you can you can for opening a hearing. Yes. Yes. And I say yes. So that's um, and you may with your uh, oh, well, what's the word? You 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 have announced your conflict of interest regarding smoking. So we do understand that it's not like you're hiding that. So you may participate in the discussion. You may, uh, for St. John's advice, recuse yourself from our decision. Is that fair? I don't know anything about it. What's the problem? Uh, this is about having a, a cigar. Uh, no, I know what the cigar thing is, but uh, Ms. Brewer, what, what is your issue? What What do you think poses? I work in tobacco education and prevention, okay. so I already have a strong view. So you, you have a bias, so to speak, and not using that word in, in a bad way, but okay. um, do you feel that it would uh, influence you in terms of your discussions, deliberation, and vote on whatever is taking place? Um, from that discussion, I don't know if I feel comfortable voting right. because uh, of my connection with prevention education. Right. Uh, I mean, I think that poses this sort of conflict that uh, might be better dealt if, if Ms. Brewer were to recuse herself from this topic, meaning discussion, deliberation. Well, all together. Right. Okay. Yes, I'm, I feel comfortable with that. Okay. So it's you and me, Pete. So um, I believe the issue is, Tracy, maybe you, you can fill in once we, uh, once I say what I say, is that you have requested uh, to have a, a booth at Ramble Fest. Uh, uh, to sell cigars from original seed and lounge. Is that correct? Um, yes. So we have been approached by several organizations since we opened to participate in community events, um, most recently by an organizer for Ramble Fest. We do know that our current tobacco permit does not give us authority to attend these events in a selling capacity. Um, so we reached out to some town administration via email to start the conversation of how we could legally go about doing this. Uh, being that this is a new scenario and one that's not been run into before, they asked us to bring this to the board's attention tonight. Uh, so Original Seed is here tonight to ask um, that we request um, to institute a one-day tobacco permit, much like the ones that the wine and malt permit that's available um, that like Berkshire breweries and Boulder Dash sellers will be able to attain to attend these events in a selling capacity. We do realize that the amend there will be amendments to town language surrounding, you know, the language and laws. Um, but we thank you for listening to us tonight and hope that you give our request um, to institute a one day tobacco sales permit adequate consideration, allowing original seed to be represented in future community events. Yes, thank you. So for clarifying, and uh, so I did go through our uh, tobacco regulations, and uh, uh, so you are, I believe, an adult-only tobacco retail tobacco store. Is that correct? That is correct. And as such, that you that you may allow smoking inside. Uh, your establishment. You may also sell to the public, but uh, the main uh, one of the things is that you are a lounge that allows smoking of the product inside. Um, so, by the regulation, I believe uh, entrance must be secure. So for a booth, if you're selling, I mean, if you're selling cigars, how do you make your booth secure? Um, well, there is a no self, you know, people can't self-service. So for instance, at an event like that, um, limited product could be brought in um, large Tupperware containers that act as travel humidors. And there could be a um, product list on the table. 
so that before people were allowed to purchase or we were to t- able to talk to them about what products were available, we could ID them just like we would in the store um, and then complete the transaction. Um, just like the breweries that will be present that have to be 21 and over, they bake you know, regulations and plans and we're just hoping that the same could be extended um, to the tobacco community. We do understand that smoking may not be allowed at the event, um, but the ability for people to find our business um, and possibly purchase product if they wish, we would like that opportunity. So how do you keep uh, someone under 21 from approaching the booth? Um, We ask for their ID and when they're not 21, we tell them that they need to leave. Same as they would, you know, with someone trying to buy alcohol. Entrance to the establishment must be secure so that access to the establishment is restricted to employees and to those 21 years or older. So we do understand we do understand that our current license does not give us the ability to sell at these events. So we are asking the Board of Health to come up with a one day permit, just like the wine and malt permit that exists that will allow Berkshire breweries and Balderdash sellers to take their business that they have to secure 21 plus sales to Mm -hmm. this event and sell their item. We are asking that the board create a one day permit that would allow people who already own a tobacco permit, the ability for a one day permit that is outside of their operational business. And yes, so the second point is, you know, your current permit uh, is, is issued to uh, establishments with a permanent non-mobile location in Adams. And so, as you say, so this wouldn't have to be a different permit altogether. Uh, And uh, I believe if we are going to uh, entertain this, we would need, if we were going to entertain issuing a new type of license, we would have to do that in a public hearing. Am I correct about that? Because we would be adding to our tobacco regulation. Correct. I, I think so. I mean, you have a tobacco regulation. You're, you're looking to uh, basically amend it or allow an exception to the uh, regulation. So I, I think you have to go through the process of dealing with the regulation because otherwise you don't have the authority to do this, right? Yes. Um, yeah, I'm thinking, I mean, I, I I'm just thinking of time frame of stuff. This is October 10th is when Ramble Fest is. Is that correct? Knows? Yeah, we we don't anticipate participating this year because we do understand that it would require um, a change in the language um, surrounding how this would be done because no current permit exists that allows this to happen. So, um, so we're, we, we understand that this is not happening for this year. Okay, so you're kind of requesting maybe for 2022 Ramble Fest or um, yeah or like the Forest Park Country Club has numerous golf tournaments there golfers are notorious cigar smokers so the ability to be able to go to you know a charity event at the Forest Park Golf Club um, would be a great opportunity for our business um, or participating in like Ramble Fest so we do understand that it is going to take a change of language um, but we are here to start the conversation um, and to make, see if it's a possibility so that we could move forward with it. So the other half of this regards the capping of permits. And if we start issuing permits willy nilly, if I could use that word, then uh, it kind of undermines this notion of limiting the number of tobacco outlets in town. Um, I I mean, because you requested a hearing, 
I, I believe that we are somewhat obligated uh, to hear pros and cons. And, uh, and I would be not adverse to holding a public hearing in, in the upcoming future uh, to discuss and decide whether we want, I think we need to have some, uh, some more information. Uh, I mean, you compare it it's, uh, to uh, a one day liquor license. Uh, it just might be a little bit different uh, because the liquor license, your the beer, wine, whatever is being given for consumption on the spot. Uh, and so this is this would be a different uh, ball of wax, as it were. So, uh, what do you what do you think, Pete? Schedule eight. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm all for, I guess, you know, getting more information. There's nothing wrong with doing that. I guess, you know, if that's the case and, and we're going to hold a future meeting about this, um, I would like to see more of a formal proposal, I guess, from original seed to kind of address some of those concerns about securing, you know, that and how the whole process would, would work, setting, you know, with a booth and you know, like the alcohol sales, you go to one table and you show your ID, you get a wristband, you get tickets, you know, how would that whole process work with, with cigar sales? You know, would it be similar or, you know, maybe like a, you know, like a, a plan or something on paper and then just more information to address some of these concerns. I guess that that's what, you know, I would like to see that if we were going to entertain this. Um, but I, you know, to your point too, with, with reducing the number of um, venues or permits or licenses in, in the town, you know, it kind of goes against what we're trying to do to, to allow this. Um, you know, I, I, I'm kind of torn because that, you know, great people, great business, you know. Um, you know, I, I don't know, Mark, go ahead. So. Typically, when you have an establishment submitting a business plan, where they have theirs, this would be, and, and they're asking for, and not just regarding their business, but I assume for any other members that might want to participate as well. So we would ask for a business plan and a schematic. And so you could make it part of your regulation. If I pause right there and just ask council, would would the board have to update the entire regulation or could they just do an amendment to the regulation dated X, Y, Z? I think they could do it by way of an amendment to the existing regulation, if that's what your question is. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's done fairly commonly. Right. Uh, so. Thank you. So, so there, there is, there are mechanisms for this to happen, okay? And, and I think that if, if you do it in this fashion, I think that, that any of those other types of events that might occur after the implementation of such a amendment, um, we would also have to um, have a, the, the permanentized process amended to reflect it's a temporary nature and, and would not affect our tobacco caps. And then the other question is the taxes, because their shop has a DOR permit. Uh, so how does the how does the tax work at a separate? Uh, so, so I don't think that the DOR issue is is our concern with their tobacco permit application, even on a temporary mm -hmm. event, that your DOR sales, the report of the DORs, I don't think that that's our concern. Would you agree? It shouldn't be. Your, your board's concern should be about the uh, health and safety. It's Correct. not about collecting taxes for the state. Right. I, no, not collecting. It, it's the uh, uh, 
our regulation says that the tax permits have to be visibly displayed uh, in, 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 the, in the shop. And so if you go into any of our tobacco retailers, they, they've got they've got not only the town permit, but they also have the DOR uh, uh, permit, the excise tax. It has to be it has to be visibly uh, displayed, mm -hmm. and, and so, and so trainings and all that. Right, and, and we would we would have that requirement under under the existing permitting establishment. Right. So they well, why would the establishment might be even if it's for from out of our community, they would they would already have that documentation submitted along with the application. So and 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 I would recommend for that amendment to the current regulation is that but it's, it's, it's not actually specified um, is that that's one of the permits where it's going to have their the establishment is going to have to appear before the board so they can make their application on the permit eyes. I'll receive it. I may have a conversation or sometimes may not. And then I will notify the board chair to put it on the agenda for the following meeting for a uh, discussion. That's, that's after the amendment would have been. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. So all those processes would be written out. Um, and, and not, this is something that would be issued out of our office. Either, you know, they contact me or Michelle and we'll issue them a checklist, so to speak, and not using one of the permit which, which applies to the entire county, or not the entire county, uh, eight other communities. So, yes, uh, yeah, I think we need we need to see what other uh, examples of this are and how it would play into. Uh, I mean, we could, for instance, put a cap on numbers of appearances or vendors. Well, you and, and I at least did get opinions from from others. Yeah. Um, so this is unique, a unique situation. Okay. It's not, yeah, it's, it's good that the board is open-minded about doing it. Um, how, how would you handle those situations where if you're talking about a cap of, of those special tobacco permits at any special event, how would you, how would you uh, regulate that or restrict any particular number if they say uh, 15 other uh, tobacco establishments have made the application for the same event? So right. Would it be a first, first term, first serve? Uh, whereas is this establishment would know sooner than an establishment, say, in Worcester. Yeah, I think that's all good points, and I think we're still, we're jumping ahead of it. I, tell, I still think, you know, we're in, right, but it would considering be, this, and then, and then, right, it would have to all be within that yeah. amendment, and, you know, I'm all for, uh, you know, drafting, having some draft the, uh, the amendment to the current regulation, and having all that information in it, so so say 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 Joyce was was going to do this, we didn't have that other conflict. <laughs> um, so so then you would shoot to me and Mark. You know what do you say? And I say okay, AJ or, or DJ and, and Jim say this, and then you make your edits, and then you you fire off Dr. Rose. Hey, how do you how do you figure? You know, or what input do you have? And then get his input. And would that be common? I mean, yes. a uh, open meeting violation? Yes, we have. We're to running into it. I okay. think, you know, it's, it's, it's it's gonna, we have to do it like we did before. Yeah. That's my concern is that it took us a long time to do the tobacco rec, you know, with, with yeah. multiple meetings and yeah, I think there were multiple things. revisions and things right. like that. So, um, you know, I, like I said, I, I'm fine for getting more information from original seed on more of a, I guess, a formal proposal on how this would happen. And then, 
you know, consider looking at that, making a consideration of, of making some amendments. I guess that's where I'm at. Um, right. Right. Um, but I do have that concern with the, you know, with our original intent of um, yeah, changing those yes regulations and the capping thing. Um, would that be a conflict of what we kind of originally were intending? So that that's where I'm I'm torn a little bit. So so one of the opinions was that that we would affect our current cap. So if if this was to happen, it would have to be by modification of the existing regulation, either by amending or rewriting it. But um. Uh, again, you, when you when you're when you're going to have your draft, you need to decide who's going to start working on that, um, and then I'll come back up with, with the edits. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I think I think we have one open permit, which will disappear in two months. Well. This would this just without these part, yeah, would fall into the development yeah. category. So, not necessarily if you were to open that, whoever the board would decide, uh, could the racing mark, um, yeah, also set up a stand. So, hey, you. Mark. Mr. John from Original Seed here. I know Hi. you like to. I know you like to do your homework, and uh, I think if you check with Pittsfield, they have Berkshire Beer Fest in the Common every year, and they have a vendor come up from Maryland called Guy and Lady Barrel Cigars. So maybe look at how they go about regulating it. I think that might help the town moving forward. Okay. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. Good place to start. So, all right. Well, thank you. I so, think we have. So, are we in agreement? We would consider this pending more information from the original seed. Yeah. And the only question is whether we schedule a, another public hearing at our next meeting or bounce it to the following. Well, I think I think I think we're still jumping ahead. We just need to, you know, Tracy and John, are they willing to provide us more of a formal proposal? with more information on how they would address some of these concerns that are in our original um, tobacco rigs. Are they willing to do that? You know, I don't know how much time it's gonna take, but, and then yeah. once, if they agree to that, then they would get that to us and then we would hold a public hearing to discuss it. So I don't think we need scheduling now until they agree and get the stuff to us. Right. That, that's the way I'm looking at the process here. And I guess the other, Question is if we do publish it, uh, who pays for publication? I mean, I didn't. well, we're not publishing their stuff, we're just publishing that we're discussing it. And that's right, true, but it's um, we don't publish, versus... we don't only publish the regulations once we get there, if we get there. No, and, and the, the newspaper announcement, uh. Is three ninety nine or two ninety nine at I Berkshire's? I don't know what it is for a a uh, single day in the Eagle. Well, it would only have to be in in a, a publication that serves the community, not all publications. Right, not all, just for a publication, really. And so, if we do have a public hearing to entertain, to consider. Uh, yeah, that would have to be published, but if we just want to put this on the agenda for next meeting to discuss whether to have a public meeting, whether to have a public hearing with further information, is that, that's a lot. That, we don't need to have a public hearing to decide <laughs> You understand what I'm asking? I know what you're asking. We don't, we don't have to discuss anything until we get information from them. Right, right. 
if they if they agree to do that. I mean, that, you know. I would I would be happy to write something up um, for the next um, meeting. I don't think you know at this point we need to hold a special meeting yet. I think that for the next um, scheduled meeting for October, um, you know, before then I can absolutely write something up um, so that you guys can see it. And if during that meantime, Mark does some research into how they make that work in Pittsfield, I think that it brings more to the table to be discussed um, for the next meeting. And then we can go from there on if we think a public meeting needs to be held. Um, and if the board, this is something that the board will support. Okay. They need to vote on it. Well, well, what would the motion be? <laughs> We're just waiting for more information. Well, yeah, the more information. yeah, they can just follow it through an old business. Yeah. So, uh, so then I will need a motion to end this public hearing. A uh, motion to end the public hearing. Second. Uh, all in favor? Uh, Joyce? Yeah. Uh, Pete? Yes. And Dave? Yes. So unanimous for out of public hearing. We will put this on our agenda for next meeting just to discuss what the next step will be in terms of uh, this model. So, all right. Well, thank you. So, do, uh, do we have the 8th Valley Street uh, people here? Your name, sir? Joe. Jim, I think you'll, you'll be next, almost next. I mean, I don't want to put you in. What is your name? I'm sorry, sir. What is your name? I got a letter from Mark Blakestone. Yeah, what is uh, your name? Chuck. 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 Uh, I'm sorry. Stephen. Yeah. Oh, Steve. oh, Chuck is the last name. Oh. C I U K. Oh, thank you. And do you need his address? Eight Valley Street. Oh, no. Your address, sir? Eight Valley Street. Is the property in question? Your residence? I'm staying with friends up in the last one. order to demolish in front of us. Uh, we're looking at the property. Did 
in the, in the public here? I forgot. Thank you. <laughs> so, yep. Uh, we closed the last one. Yeah. So, Eight Valley Street public hearing. Motion to open uh, Eight Valley Street public hearing. Second. Uh, all in favor? Joyce. Yeah. Yes. And they, yes. We're now we're now open here. Uh, all right. So on June 20, 2011, uh, the code enforcement officer at the time, Scott Casella, issued a condemnation order on this uh, this vacant property. Um, around that time, the fire department applied a uh, a placard to the to the house. Yes, underneath the uh, attic window, and that that placard at the time would have would have looked. Yeah. like this uh, and this is a universal symbol to public safety personnel that no yeah. interior firefighting should occur due to unsafe conditions inside um i i have uh refreshed that condemnation order on june 26 2021 and within that order gave a description of what I observed from the public way to be the violations uh, of that particular property. The, the property, uh, the correction order, the condemnation order was served in accordance with statute. I do have the green card showing your seat. Uh, Mr. Chooks, um, only known address is a field box in North Adams, but he has indicated that he's temporarily staying with uh, some acquaintances up in Vermont. So we don't have a residential address, not that that makes any service bad. Um, he was also served with notice of this hearing as well as notice of non-compliance on September 9th, 2021, and, and told, uh, to make arrangements with us or me um, by 8.30 this morning for an interior inspection, which has not occurred. I will emphasize to you that the uh, firefighting placard is, is still posted on the house as of this morning. The condition of the property uh, from the public way um, as of this morning was still the same as it is now. Um, and code allows uh, me the opportunity to bring this matter before the board uh, for in order to demolish. And this order to demolish would order Mr. Chuck to demolish the property within 90 days. If he doesn't, the, the town uh, would then have uh, the ability to pursue uh, Demolition of the property. Of course, we would have the next step after in order to demolish would be to pursue a uh, court complaint for non compliance with the sanitary code um, and, and ask the court for permission for the town then to enter onto the property and, and effect disposition of this order to demolish. So at this time, I will turn it over to Mr. Chuck to answer to the to the correction orders issued, condemnation order in particular, and the notice of non compliance in, in consideration of our of, of my uh, bringing this matter and asking the board to order the property demolished. You know, the first thing uh, I'm on a very small social security check. I haven't been, I haven't worked in, I think about eight, nine years. No, I, I do know it's in, it's in bad repair. I, I just don't have the need to make any corrections or whatever to the property. Were there taxes owed on the property? Or... Huh? No, no tax. No. So there, there was several years ago, with the help of my, my brother and someone else, they paid it off the tax as well.
So if Mr. Chuck does nothing, you can have the house demolished and that would be a lien on his property. Correct. Or he could have it demolished and sell the land. I, well, he, he could also demolish the property and hold on to the land. He is maintaining uh, the grass. He is taking yeah, yeah, grass. that's not so that. that was, yeah. um, but, you know, he has, he has options. He could sell the parcel as is uh, to someone who would be willing to rehabilitate the property. Um, I know the building commissioner in Pittsfield, the former building commissioner in Pittsfield was always encouraging of properties that even in this state that could be rehabilitated with, by the proper person. Right. Okay, who pulls all the required permits and whatnot. So there are options available to Mr. Cho. Uh, within the order of condemnation, I did also um, indicate other court enforcement options that were available uh, to me as the enforcer, uh, one being receivership. Um, as the board knows, my the board health budget has been frozen, so I can't, can't make an application uh, to the court um, presently without permission from uh, the director of inspection services and, and our town administrator. Um, so uh, even, even though there's only one party to be served here, um, I, I would be able to obtain a receiver for this property. And then all costs that the town did incur at the end of the receivership would be recuperated. Um, all that notwithstanding, um, you can still pursue a, a court order receivership with an order to demolish. Matter of fact, in Pittsfield, I know of two occasions where where the receiver, the appointed receiver, um, did actually demolish the property and sell to nobody business owner. Um, so this doesn't close the door for any code enforcement opportunities, but what this order of demolish um, does is, is, is let the, the property owner know that um, this, this can't continue. It's been going on for more than 10 years. Um, there are, are reports of uh, nuisance wildlife as well as rats. Um, he has, this is the first occasion I've had um, to ever meet with him, uh, even though the, my original order, uh, it was dated June of uh, last year. So I, I'd emphasize to the board that this is the best that property is going to be. As you can see, the front of those porch is collapsing. Um, there are old casement windows where panes are falling out of. Um, and, and it proves to be um, public health and public safety. Do you like on the neighborhood? So I, would ask, I would ask the board to authorize the order to demolish. I, go ahead. Sure. Yeah, I, I just wanted to speak to some issues that I raised with Mark by email earlier uh, this afternoon when Mark sent me the proposed order to demolish. Um, there's a statute that governs this, Chapter 111, Section 127B, and that, that statute requires that the Board of Health make certain findings on the property. Um, I, I asked I asked Mark if he could produce an order from the Board of Health, however long ago it was, that declared this property was unfit for human habitation. Uh, the statute requires that before you can get into further things like orders to vacate, as well as demolition. There's obviously a situation involving emergency orders that can be undertaken, but again, the Board of Health itself has to make that. So, I am concerned about, you know, whether that exists or not, because uh, from my standpoint, if I have to represent the town 
uh, in court with respect to either a receivership or getting an order to demolish the property, for example, I don't have the necessary legal footing for it to do that. Um, another, another thing that comes up with these properties and what historically has been done in Adams is something called the Board of Survey, uh, which involves a, a group, and if I recall correctly, the fire chief, the building commissioner, and I think one other citizen was involved to make a determination about whether the property ought to be demolished. Uh, one of the concerns that you have to have with this is who's gonna pay for the demolition. Is it somebody who was getting very little on social security and, and is he gonna be able to afford it? If the town has to pay for it, that expense is gonna to have to go through and be approved by a town meeting in all likelihood. And what is the potential for the town to recover its lien from this property? So uh, there's, there's a bit involved in this process. I just wanted to bring it up to you where it starts with, from my, where I am is finding out whether this or a prior board has made any orders regarding whether this property is unfit for human habitation. So in, Well, going back to, to when I was hired, I was recruited from the city of Pittsfield. The, our, our current town administrator um, was a member of the board of health, as well as what, at one point, the chairman of the board. Um, our current building commissioner slash director of inspectional services actually recruited me. He used to be the building commissioner in Pittsfield. So prior to coming here, he had asked me for the templates that we used in Pittsfield because we wanted to put those to use here in Adams. So what I have learned quite recently um, is that is that even though since my first day working here, I had been issuing correction orders, issuing condemnation orders, this being the very first order to demolish. Um, now I'm being told that anything that I'm doing, Adams has its own unique processes. And in, in you know, again, you know, I'm, you know, after, after working here a year and a half, and then all of a sudden having the reins being pulled back because of another interpretation of the statute. Um, we have in, in Pittsfield, these very same orders to demolish the very same notices of non-compliance <laughs> issued by the code enforcement officer, the very same uh, orders of condemnation or determination by the inspector that the building is unfit for human ha habitation um, have all passed scrutiny um, whenever they've been um, appealed to the, to the housing court. Um, there was one appeal uh, early on in my tenure to Pittsfield where it was uh, before the Superior Court. And, and as I stated, we get court orders to enter upon someone's personal property to affect compliance with the correction order. And, and all of those prior challenges, I'm just saying that to receive an email from, from current town council, though his responsibility is to the town and not to Pittsfield, um, 35 minutes ahead, when, when I sent it to him um, last Friday, and I understand that, he, that he's got other obligations as to all of us, um, again, I, I've been walking uh, in these booths in this town for uh, 23 months. So, so at the, again, this is literally at the 11th hour where it, it, because of 
a set of circumstances. They're pulling back my reins all of a sudden on virtually everything that I'm doing. Well, so, before you, before you, that, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, before you go on, um, we do have an untenable situation at our hand here. Uh, in that this house has to be has to be dealt with. Um, and the question is is how um, we have options you know, one of which you said was receivership. Um, and I mean I know the board of health has a budget. I trying to get myself some understanding of who can approve expenditures from the board of health budget obviously we have some sway because we made a recommendation to uh, contract with the first public health alliance for nursing public health nursing services uh, and and that cost money uh, is that approval of funds fund expenditure i don't know um uh, actually like to get some clarification if the board feels that something should be done that will cost money uh, whether it's posting a public notice uh, or uh, entering into uh, appeal, applying for receivership, do we have the authority? I guess I'm asking you, Attorney St. John, do we have the authority here to approve an expenditure by our health enforcement agent in order to uh, accomplish something the board feels should be accomplished well you have to say within your budget um you know the fact that your elected officials gives you uh some latitude in terms of what you can do your budget uh what you submit is what's been approved by uh the Town, town of Adams to the town meeting, and you're limited to that. So if your budget limits postage, for example, to $500, it's limited to $500. Uh, you know, and in terms of how you want to spend money, if you decide that you want to spend money and demolish this building out of your budget, it better be in your budget, unless you can get approval from town meeting. And that means going through uh, the finance committee, the town administrator, the board of selectmen, and so on and so forth. Well, I know, I know, for instance, that uh, we budgeted, I believe, four thousand dollars for education promotion, and you know what the third category is, and uh, we, as far as I know, we only went through nine hundred. $70 transferred that to the public health nursing because the alliance contract was much larger than the original one with Berkshire DNA. Um, as far as that, I'm unaware of any other expenditures from that line. Now, I know it's not enforcement, code enforcement or legal fees, but it is money there that we could transfer into the appropriate line item for expenditure. Well, you need to have a conversation with the town administrator, maybe the town accountant, before you get into that. Actually, I agree. So, sure. so yes, yes for that. So, um, just for clarification, this is in order to demolish to Mr. Cho um, within the specified ninety days. This by no means obligates the town to to take any action against this property, uh, up to and including demolition. Um, and and we couldn't even go on to the property uh, without a court order. So um, this doesn't mandate the town, us, the board, 
to do anything other than to extend postage uh, to serve notice upon uh, Mr. Chuck. And he hasn't been served. He has not. He has been served the order to demolish because you haven't decided to say uh, order. He has been properly served with the uh, with the condemnation, the notice of non-compliance, notice of hearing, and uh, as an attachment to the uh, order of condemnation was was Inspector uh, Casella's uh, June 2000. So how much would it cost to serve? Uh, say roughly eight dollars. <clears throat> roughly eight dollars. All right. So I will. I mean, Jay uh, did indicate that. Uh, I think he indicated that he would meet with me. I have I have postage in my possession. Just when I exceed that postage, then I have to get permission to get votes in I'm not shall the save. Person. <laughs> What's in her safe? And then once I expend that, then I then I would have to get because I can't imagine that month and a half into the fiscal year that that we had expended. Our postage, I, I'm just at all. But it's five, I think it was five hundred, five hundred dollars. There's no way we expended that. The request, that was, the the request that I had were making it go over, so then it got next, and then we reapplied new postage amounts of what we were ordering. So it would have gone over. Five hundred dollars. Yes. All right, I, I need to set up a meeting with Crystal All right, uh, because uh, th this uh, th this budget totally baffles me. It, it has baffled me for years. I have tried to get control. So, uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I get a little agitated myself. It's like I keep asking questions and I keep getting bobbed off. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I, I, will, I will try to get a decent budget run. So I know, I know, because heaven knows if we're if we're over the if we're over the postage limit already, then when I make my proposal in a couple when we make our proposal in the next couple of months, we need budget enough for I mean, does that make sense? Well, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean just just in a two week period of time when I started keeping <laughs> like, uh you know, we were we were at you know, less than 10% of that figure. So, you know, once we, and, and also this year, we had to, we're getting off topic, but we had to divide that figure from uh, our, our prior administrative assistant was, was shared with other departments. So, um, but again, we're getting off topic. So, uh, with regard to the story to demolish, um, Attorney St. John, you know, brings up, you know, the point that he's he's counsel for the town and he doesn't feel comfortable. Uh, eventually, the story to demolish will have to go um, to the court, the very same courts who have approved uh, the uh, orders in in another community. But he doesn't feel comfortable because this particular board hasn't ordered the property or, uh, or found the property to be unfit for human habitation, which is actually the condemnation order. So once, so if he's going to influence this board in that respect, and I, I would say in any other set of circumstances, maybe that would be prudent. But this is going to start the clock again. For one year, so you won't be able to issue the order to demolish for another year, so long as my predecessor were to be uh, on top of it and then come back and forth. Um, you know, and, and there's been a number of cases when Jay has come down to me and say, "Yes, go ahead and implement the condemnation, start that clock rolling." So um, our town administrator. You know, has has that expertise of being an attorney as well as being a board health member for a number of years, and and I'm sure that if, if 
his interpretation was was that the orders of condemnation had to have a declaration from the board of health rather than the board's agent. Um, again, I, I would emphasize that of all the trainings that I've had, um, that the only document the board needs to sign is the order to demolish. So, so are you asking us to sign an order to demolish? I am. Then, uh, uh, I have a question. Um, have the neighbors of the property been notified of this public hearing? Two of the neighbors have been. Okay. Yes. And and is anybody here a neighbor? I don't know anybody else. Uh, nobody is physically present. Is there anybody on Zoom? The only people that are on Zoom is a Jack Munn. Um, I guess would anybody want? Down. Does anybody want us? How many opinions from the neighbors have any opinions on this, I guess? Well, I, I would, I've conveyed their um, their desire. Um, this is not a property that I that I saw on my own accord. But the vast majority of these vacant properties that I do code enforcement on are by way of complaints. Um <clears throat> so the the most recent complaints to that brought me to this property uh, for the non-compliance uh, were of, of the nuisance vermin and the and the rats. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that was by uh, two neighbors, not the one whose neighbor's car you see here. Um, and this is not the only property like that. There's a house two doors to the left, east of this property, uh, where I also have a condemnation order in place. Um, but again, with my volume of my work, I, I don't have time to drive around the town. Um, but when I was ratified, I was asked um, what I intended to do uh, for the town with regard to these blighted properties. And, and I did articulate that. Uh, so contained within the minutes of my ratification. So the neighbors do make complaints, and I do reply or respond to them. So if we issue an order to demolish, uh, what's the? I mean, it, it, it wouldn't happen tomorrow. It would happen no earlier than when? The, the service of the order or the demolition? The demolition. It, it would depend on on the property owner to either secure the funds to demolish the property or to um, assume he wants to be compliant mm -hmm. um, or to find a buyer for the property who could then, if there was a buyer, we would reserve the orders um, and then um, Typically, you would have somebody who's going to either present a plan to rehab the property, and he would have his, as it so indicates in the, in the proposed order, is that the process could be halted if he delivers to the Adams Board of Health an executed contract with the contractor, which includes a commencement and anticipation commencement completion date. So, you always get to this consideration, always get consideration, is someone who wants to do something more than you desire with. So if he right. has another alternative, he can certainly come forth with it. He's not here today knowing or maybe having, you know, a, a, a preconceived opinion of, of what actions that we would take um, for him to bring the property into compliance. So, so um, Mr. Chuck, can you, do you have... Um, what are your plans for the property? I guess I I have no money to to do anything with it. Like I said, I'm very small. What would you like to see happen? Well, you had somebody mentioned receivership. I mean, you know, it's been quite a while. And I I you know quite an issue. Can't do anything about it. Well, but it you know, and, and if there's 
Any paperwork? I, I, I keep on hearing these books. Is there any paperwork or, that I could sign to push things along to help the board out? I mean, I'm basically, I'm basically willing to give up the property to, to get out the money. So I, I can, I can certainly um, have a meeting with the building commissioner or the director of the well, we're in the path, have the director of the special services and the town administrator uh, as far as pursuing a court complaint for receivership for this property. Um, the the only cost would be, for well, this that respect would be the sheriff's service of the summer. What about the receiver's costs? What's that? You know how much a receiver costs? Does it cost uh, the town anything? Or, well, that's not true, Mark. Well, it would cost the town something unless the town were able to recoup the money. Which we had a receivership here several years ago in which we had a landlord who couldn't maintain his properties. The receiver stepped into the shoes of the landlord, was able to get the property rehab and recoup his fees out of like rental income and that type of thing. This, this doesn't sound to me like a rental income situation. I mean, it sounds to me like it's a situation where the town is going to be incurring a lien for the cost of the receiver, the cost of the demolition and whatever else. <clears throat> And, and again, I've had experience with, with receivership working in video. So, so the complaint filed in court doesn't cost any cost service fees, share service fees, any cost for, for town council would be recouped at the end of the receivership after the receiver gets court approval to dispense of the property. Um, and then, so they'll, they'll pay all expenses on the property. They will recoup their lien, they will recoup whatever. Uh, and, and during the receivership, there's a, a, a periodic review. So whatever experiences the town has had with receiverships um, previously, um, it, it was quite costly. It used to have that reputation of being costly to the municipalities. Um, but I, I'd say, well, I don't know, two years, so I, I'd say since 2018, 2017, 2018, municipalities have recouped their costs for receivership because it's under a new structure. Um, so again, you, you, the town couldn't recoup its costs at the end of the receivership, which could go on for two years or, um, like I said, if you have, uh, uh, and these are all approved receivers, okay? The court has approved them. And, and a lot of the ones that are on the receivers list for Western Massachusetts are also on the attorney general's list for receivership. So I, I'd say, you know, if we can, if we, well, first, point is the order to demolish can still be issued. We don't have to take action on on demolishing the building if, if Mr. Chuck is not compliant within that time. Um, is, you know, after, um, again, I would have to meet with the director of the special services and the town administrator to get approval before I even have to go for receivership. Right. Okay. So, you know, that whole new policy um, actually halts and unnecessarily extends code enforcement. Um, so here for the board, I ask, I ask that you approve this order to demolish and you know, I'll serve it upon, I'll have it served upon Mr. Chuck in the terms of statute. And then if he if he does want to pursue other options, I can certainly meet with him on how many other occasions are convenient and discuss many other options. <clears throat> so so I get confused about uh, if we do issue an order to demolish, 
it would not have to be carried out immediately and it would be time for us to uh if mr chuck and you and commissioner garner on council da green come to a reasonable solution uh ahead of time that is not demolition mm -hmm. that would be we would have time to set up Right, and the, the only reason why we need to meet with, with Commissioner Garner or um, TA Green is for approval to pursue the receivership, any expenditure with regard to escalating the correction order. Um, I would not need to meet with them to have a discussion with Mr. Chuck about other options right, right. to dispense the property on his own. So um, there is no requirement uh, and, and you know, I have I have offered um, videos of of those hearings with the Pizza Board of Health. It was also an occasion where Commissioner Gardner and I appeared on a local uh, television special with regard to the demolitions, and I've pers participated in uh, quite a number of receiverships, <laughs> as I stated that that some of which did include demolitions. So um, these these orders to demolish don't have to be affected by the town with any specified period of time. The vast majority of, of the occasions where the, the, the city um, has demolished, the city of Pittsfield has demolished buildings, the vast majority of those orders have been in place for a year. And, and just to mention further, there's the distinction between the board of survey that that town council was speaking of that's led by the uh, the building commissioner that's separate from the board of health that's separate from the board of health so um it, it, in order to demolish or condemnation order does not have to run concurrent with the board of survey it's separate that's its own separate thing and, and under uh town code um that's how a, a building commissioner can in effect condemn a property by using different words so um may we have a motion to condemn and then on a parallel set up a meeting i mean i would like do you mean in order to demolish that order to yes demolish it um get that trap going and then on a parallel track, meet. I I I wouldn't go down that the, okay. the secondary path. Um, do the order to demolish. Uh, I now have Mr. Chuck's phone number. Okay. Uh, and and we can be in conversation about methods by which we can where you can dispose of the property. Then I I have a motion to. Can demolish. I just just demolish your what? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I guess I just have concern that town council is is not comfortable with us um, voting on this now, I guess, or even just approving it now. Maybe not. Um, so, because the process, in your opinion, the process hasn't been followed. Is that is that correct? I don't think I understand. Right. I don't have any information that, first of all, the board or previous boards have determined this property is unfit for human habitation. You could simply make that motion if you wanted to and clear that issue right now for me. There's another provision in this statute which kind of goes along with what Mr. Blaisdell is telling you about. And it, it's more of an emergency situation, but from what I've seen and heard, this might not be too far from that. But in, in that statute that I read to you, that if the board upon written certification to it by the head of the local health department, uh, if this states that immediate demolition or removal is essential to protect the health and safety of the public, they can cause such demolition or removal within 90 days um, of, of the closure. I mean, it, it speaks to emergency action that can be taken, and uh, that may be a way of addressing this. 
but you should at least so that if you go to court, somebody on this board, an elected board has made that determination uh, of property being unfit for human habitation, at least you have. So should we go visit the place and take a look ourselves with that? It's a good idea, in my opinion. May we? I mean, can we get inside? The other officials have, have designated property having unsafe conditions inside. Um, Mr. Chuck could certainly open the door for you. The door gets over the, uh, the doors. So is that permission for one of the board members and Mark to enter the property? Yeah, and whoever needs to go in at any time without you being present. That's yeah, that's fine by me. Yeah, I just out of board property. But that because I, I trust I trust my colleagues who posted that that symbol that I, I'm yeah. not going onto the property. I'm not even going onto the front steps. I guess we stop there. If nobody's going to go visit it. Then, then we're we'll stuck because I'm not going to vote. I'm not going to go against the town council says. So was there, tell you right now. Was the red X thrown up by Chief Pansaki? Probably not. We don't know who it's from. That's the issue. We don't know who made that determination. <clears throat> and Mark's not willing to go now. He just said, "I even step foot on the grass." No, I said the steps. Oh, yeah, steps. Okay. And that's just in the front of the property. Is there a back door on the property? Yes, sir. Yeah, back door. Back door. So, back door. So yeah, my observation is from public access. Um, right. So, if Mr. Chuck is given permission for us to go around the back, <laughs> then we certainly need to do that. Did you, is there a reason why you would not want to be present? Just that it, it's a uh, you know, the about forty minute ride down down to here. Right. So maybe, yeah, I, I think Mr. Don is here. Have you uh, attempted to list the property with any real estate agents so they could some, sell it? Some real estate agent um oh god several months ago. Um in town, and she said that she knew people that we had. Now she just saw the, the porch thing there. They did a they did a walkthrough real quick, and uh -huh. uh, they, they never got back to. It. I mean, it oh. is very bad to be. I would I would recontact her, merge her on, <laughs> find somebody else. <laughs> yeah. So all right. Um, you can get all the money. You might have a few dollars left afterwards. And then in that. <laughs> Is there a way we can research a history of a, a, a Valley Street? I know I have well my well who, do you know some of the names of the previous inspectors or whatever the title is? No, I mean yeah. when did you buy Scott Casella was one that okay. Yeah, did he issue a condemnation order on the property then? Scott? I don't know if it was him or not. But he, that means Scott? Scott yes. Scott did issue a condemnation order. Um, I did not find that it was served in accordance with statute, so then I researched it. You know, my concern is that if to satisfy the town council, that you have to. You, you're in essence issue, reissuing the condemnation. You're starting at one year clock again. Um, so, you know, if, if to satisfy, now again, I, I've been here almost two years. I, I, I'm okay. And I have not issued orders. And, and the director of the special services, the, the town administrator, and town council know that I have issued these orders. Um, and, and all of a sudden, because of a particular matter, like I said, everything is being questioned. Um, and this, this is not what I expected when, when I appeared before the board of selectmen and was gratified for this position. Hey. 
you, you, you're going to have a lot of dissatisfied uh, residents who. And I see here in June of 2017, there was an anonymous trash complaint. Uh, yeah, that's the only reference I seem to have. To this property. When that's 2017 is obviously subsequent to Scott. Well, can we table this until next meeting until we get more information or try to find more information? You, you're not going to find um, anything where where it, this town's board of health made any such declaration on this uh, particular property. Right. Okay. So I'm going to say uh, I'm bailing on this. We have five minutes before we got to get out of here. Uh, we have a lot on our agenda yet, which is just going to get swept aside for now. Uh, Mr. Donis has been waiting patiently here. I came for the whole meeting. Well, <laughs> you, especially the, the first three rings. Motion to close public hearing on 8 Valley Street. Second. Okay. Yes. Uh, Joyce. Yes. Eight. Yes. Eight. Yes. So it's unanimous. Um, the only, we will revisit this. Not sure whether we will do it under old business or public hearing, but uh, so please that we'll contact you and you will move forward from there. Um, old business, uh, 8 Valley Street, uh, not 8 Valley, uh, uh, 103 Friend Street, Mr. Donis, uh, how is he doing, Officer Blaisdell? He's um, probably slow, um, but you did give him also next meeting right I mean, not next meeting but next month it would have been the October next month. Six. so so I am um if we if we do meet in two weeks uh we won't ask you to come mm -hmm. but the following meeting uh mm -hmm. not sure when that will be we won't ask you so yes go ahead well as you said, progress has been slow. Uh, contractors, as we all know, they can't get their work completed because of the rain. They can't get their work completed because of lack of work crews. That's our situation. But I've got a contractor who's going to come in and do the, the foot porch uh, flooring over. Right. He may be able to start by Saturday or Monday, anyways. Uh, talk to the boys. If you see him around, take a sharpie. APS <laughs> off the boys because now down to Stash and the boy. I followed home one time from Langford. My son was coming back from Pittsfield. He let one guy off from church. He went to his house and he was alone in the truck. He said, I need at least three guys to do your job. I can't get anybody to hire. Well, I've called several other tree services and we're going to get somebody to do it. Troy? Yeah. Huh? I already had Troy. He didn't want to go in. He didn't like the access to the backyard. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> And you didn't walk over and look in the back there. He said, You don't see stock and boys. Well, now it's time with stock and boy. And we're going to, I contacted a fellow in Chester. He's got two young, strong sons that work with him. We'll have a three man crew at least probably with him. Mm -hmm. I contacted other tree services as well. We got to get this moving. Yeah, that's, you know. So I appreciate it. I know that the contractors have issues, but I'm contacting everybody else and whoever can come in and get it done. It may not be stock, it doesn't look like it's going to be at all. Somebody else, perhaps. So the operative word I heard from Austin Blaisdell was was progressing. Yeah. And so yeah. Uh, it took us four places to find type of boards we would need to replace the floorboards on the on the floor. Nobody uses that kind of stuff anymore. No, no, no. The house was built in 1910 or 1900, whatever it was, but finally we got up to we called the uh, lumber company in Stamp, Vermont, HP Lumber. He has some beautiful three inch uh, tongue and groove match uh, board red oak stuff. So we got that already in hand. Well, it's just mm -hmm. in bad. <laughs> we, we, we have heard enough. We, we yeah. actually are supposed to get out of here in yeah. a couple minutes. And I need to see what Mr. Munn 
once. So thank you. We will be in touch okay. for a, an October meeting. And uh, uh, yeah, if I if I see Stosh, check on the slides that last us off. Yeah, right, right. Well, actually, I need I need I need yeah. Michelle to correct because she put an S on boys, but it's actually a Z. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a Z. Yeah, he does that way. God, D A H boys with a Z. Yeah. He needs to strike that Z. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Donna. <laughs> uh, we have this, uh, Mr. Jack uh, Munn. Do we know him? Mr. Munn, are you here for anything or just to watch? Huh? No, Hearing nothing. nothing. Uh, Ms. Foster, uh, you stuck it out the whole meeting. <laughs> it's uh, kind of interesting. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, we're ready to adjourn. And uh, we skipped over. Can we? Well, we, we did have we did have a comment, but if uh, you would like to say something now, I would be happy for uh, one minute. <laughs> Can we approve the minutes? Should we do that? We can do. Yeah. Uh, we can't hear you, Ms. Foster. Yes. Um, on the Town of Adams homepage, your meeting tonight was listed at five. It was? Yes. And obviously it was at four. And that's that is what the uh, agenda says, but the meeting notice itself says five. I just wanted you to be aware of that so it doesn't carry over to the next one. You just pulled it up? Yeah. Yeah. Is it on the calendar or something? A different I'm, I'm, it says upcoming events, four o'clock. Um, I'm on the front page. Is that what you're talking again? Um, it's on the front page. Hold on, I'll go there. I'm seeing it, it says four. And yeah, and then when you hover over the 15th, it also says four. So, when you click. And the agenda says four. Huh. Well, it did say five. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think this is sort of. Oh, yeah, I think that's where it said it. Yes. I know where anyway. it said it. Well, if thank you. Go if you go to minutes and agendas, if you get there that way, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, under, under agendas, it does say five o'clock. I'm looking at it right now. I don't see where it's Where you go, minutes and agendas, agendas, board of health agendas, and then it lists all the agendas chronologically. The one for today says 5 p.m. The amended one says four, which is the operative one. So, all right. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, thanks for pointing it out. Do you mean that? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, we will be sure. Uh, so, we have two minutes here. It's uh, February 10th. Were revised just to say that the meeting uh, we encountered a recording um, glitch, and so I um, terminated the meeting early. Uh, so that's. Uh, uh, did anybody have any? I, I I guess didn't we approve that already? These minutes, and it did state that. Well, Attorney St. John wanted us to actually say why the meeting was ended. It, I think that it said that, but I looked at the, the minutes that were sent to us. I think the difference is, is it still had agenda items on the bottom. And I, if I remember right, we voted to amend that to take those off. But I think that what that posted didn't show why. Right, why but what was posted. Why it was happening. I think. I think that was the whole issue that Ms. Foster had. That the, the minutes of February 10th didn't say. No, I think the issue Ms. Foster had was they weren't posted on the website. But then they were. They were. 
but it didn't but, show that we we closed the meeting because of the computer glitch. She's but she's the, correct. That the minutes just weren't accurate. That's all. So, so I think what we're here to today is <laughs> so what we voted on wasn't posted. That's the issue. That's what I'm saying. So there were just different minutes. So, so it's, think, it's, we, okay. when we originally got presented these minutes in in March, I looked I looked this up, and it's going to take me a while to find it now. But it had it had the statement that it was ended because of a computer issue, and then it had the rest of the right. agenda still exactly. on there. That's true. And it, I think Attorney St. John said we need to take that off. Correct. And I think what and happened it, it didn't get taken you... off; it just got posted. No, what got posted, it did get taken off, but the information about why why it was closed down because okay. of the computer glitch, that, that got deleted got, as okay. well. Okay, so, so my next question is, <clears throat> is what Haley has, is that what was posted on the website? Because what, what Haley has is official, not what's posted on the website. And what Haley has has the deleted information of why we closed it. It just okay. stopped. It. Yeah, so okay. she doesn't have the updated stuff. Okay, thank you. That clears the question. <laughs> Clarify the okay. okay. So. So I've updated it. Motion. Yes, thank you. Motion to approve February 10 uh, minutes as amended correctly now. <laughs> Second. <laughs> no further discussion. Joyce. Oh, you, she would have seen. I would have to say. Oh, I don't want to tell you how to yeah. vote. Okay. No, I'd rather. That's what I was going to say. Okay. Yeah, so vote. yes for me, yes and, for me, and yes from from Pete. So it passes. That, thank you, Michelle, for that clarification. Oh, you're welcome. I get a little confused. Uh, that's okay. So, that's We're right. I'm eating dinner. <laughs> thank you for oh. fixing that. No, no. <laughs> uh, you're okay. So uh, the minutes and. Uh, uh, Michelle, I'm sorry. I've got August 18th. A, a load of a small typos. I will send this to you. I'm going to rip through them myself. So uh, please hang on. Uh, uh, well, should we just, should you just send those typos to her? And I, I, I will meeting? send them, but it's the minutes. This is which, which meeting was this? We're talking about we're talking August about 18. 18th draft DVR. Okay, here it is. Um, so I'm just going down here on the bottom of page one. Uh, the uh, uh, fire department at the uh, district uh, uh, is Stan Tech S T A N. T E C stand tech. Oh, sorry. S no, 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 no. Say that again. S T stand tech. Uh, T E uh, S T A N T E C. Uh, and then uh, about a little under half the way down uh, for under Mr. Donis, uh, Stosh and the boys. What page are you on? I'm confused too. Yeah. Uh, so it's the second page, public hearing, it's second paragraph under Donis. Uh refer to Stosh and the boys. Oh yes. Yeah, there there are some apostrophes there, but I'm not gonna be too <laughs> uh, and at the bottom of that page, it's actually ballasts, B-A-L-L-A-S-T-S, -L -L right? Uh, what line for, number is that? Um the last, the very last line. The first word in the last line. Oh yeah. Ballast. B A L L A S T S. They're ballast. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, I'll also have you know that the the word document that I've been saving as okay. was a very old, old version. So uh, it's not catching a lot of typos. Oh yes, I know so, I'm like computer old Yeah, so I'm trying to get onto the newer version. So hopefully going forward it won't be as horrible. So uh, on the next page, the second second line, the outlets that are GFI, ground fault indicator, GFI. And uh, in the next paragraph, uh, next to last line, Mrs. Hain, 
uh, you have a have H A Y N instead of H A H N. Tell me which paragraph I'm in now. So that's the second paragraph. Uh, that's the last line. Oh, uh, but, yeah. Mrs. Hayes. Yeah, H is just, I mean, uh, uh, oh, H N H. Yeah. A H. Question about this. And then, uh, so I am going down to page seven. Um, if we start at the bottom, going up, cannabis, C A N N A B I S. I see you were never a hippie. <laughs> totally not. B A N N A. B I S. B I S. Thank you. Or you could just say we. Uh, and uh, the school reopening paragraph. Uh, there are actually a few things here. Uh, this is Rose. Um, the second sentence, Mr. Blinsko explained that 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 the sentence I didn't really understand. Mr. Blaisdell explained that Dan Doyle. Desi met last week with school, which the school reporting will not be posted. Uh, oh, yeah, Mr. Blaisdell was saying something to the effect that Desi yeah. was meeting and it won't get posted until August 19th. Right. Well, I think you can knock out Dan Doyle because okay. uh, you may have mentioned Dan, but uh, and Desi is just one S. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's okay. So, and then uh, um, four or five lines down, BART, um, you, you can capitalize that B A R T in all caps. Okay. Well, uh, okay. 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 Under review, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Amy Manley. Oh. Still have Mr. John 